have reached another episode of Girls with Dogs. This is Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging. I'm here with my dear friend, Kathy of Groovy Golden Doodles. And today we have another guest and um, we are going to be talking about grooming, right? Yes, yes we are. So um, Kathy, why don't you introduce our guest? So everybody, I want you to meet the official Groovy Golden Doodle groomer. If you've ever looked at pictures of Harley and Jackson since 2016 and you like the way they looked then Andy Green is the person that has been doing the dogs now I'm really excited about this podcast because um, many of you who either follow my blog follow Kimberly on social media or listen to our podcast know that in the beginning of the year um, Harley got kicked out of a particular <laughs> local grooming salon, and I was devastated, mortified, confused, and speechless. So long story short, I left Andy because Andy's schedule changed, and that's not a bad thing for her. I had a new job, and I wasn't able to match the availabilities that she had. So this is another good reason why when you leave an establishment, you leave on good terms. You never get a case of the ass and storm out <laughs> and bad mouth them on social media because your behind is going to have to come back. <laughs> and I was able to come back proudly. I didn't have to slither in, you know, head tucked down because I came back to Andy and I said, look, I'll do whatever I need to do. I'll bring the boys whatever time. But Harley was accused of freaking out, um, having drier seizures, which Kimberly and I had never heard of. And um, the groomer pretty much said, paraphrasing now, um, some senior dogs just don't need to be groomed as much. So I'll continue to do Jackson, but I, I, I can't do Harley anymore. Bring him in every once a month and I'll try to cut him. And I'd like so, to interrupt and say, he actually said that one. Yes, that one. And I thought, <laughs> yes. And I thought, well, damn. <laughs> well, I, I thought worse than that. I mean, it's been like six months and you don't even know his name, that one. <laughs> so, when I came back to Andy, um, she did such an incredible job. The things that she talked about, and I don't believe she did it because we had a prior history or a great relationship. I think she did it because of the professional groomer that she is. She asked me to hang um, in the back and she did things very slowly. I watched her when Harley, you know, jerked and pulled away. She took the time, she nuzzled up to him. She stopped with the clippers. And by the second time I went, she didn't even need me. So I really wanted Andy to come on the show, talk about grooming um, senior dogs, especially because we got so much feedback on social media. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing bad, with the exception of the person that really <laughs> attacked. And she said, well, when? I don't Not feel I attacked her. I just corrected her. <laughs> and, um, but so many people had so many valuable things to say. Um, and so many people had questions. So I wanted to have her come on. She's got close to 20 years experience as a groomer. And as far as I'm concerned, she is the badass groomer of senior dogs. So oh, Andy, <laughs> tell us whatever it is that I did not include. I think you summed it up pretty well and you made me feel good about myself. So, no. I <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, I have a question because, you know, grooming somewhat like training has always, um, I shouldn't say always, but in some worlds is kind of like the rich people type of thing. You know, you don't need to go to a groomer. And I want to tell you why is it that you exist and you provide the service that you do and why is that important? Well, it's important to a lot of people to understand the, the amount of work that goes into it. And there are a lot of people, especially during COVID that um, it kind of worked out well for me because a lot of people tried to do it at home and realized how much more difficult it is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a incredible amount of patience and skill and time that you have to invest to actually really get good at this profession. And it's not just so much even about the dogs, you have to be good with the people too. So it's kind of, you know, you're going back and forth between those two things and trying to have a relationship with, you know, the owners, obviously, but I mean, we bond very strongly with these dogs. 
you have to think, you know, some people will come in every other week. So, I mean, I see these dogs more than I see my family. <laughs> see these people more than I see my family. So in, in a way, they are kind of like a family to me. So it's important to find a groomer that you're comfortable with, someone that you can relate to, because there needs to be a transparency there with your expectations of what you want, you know, how the dogs are acting. You know, it's a, just a friendship relationship at that point. Yeah. When we first um, added Apollo to our house, he is a husky golden retriever mix, which is a lovely combination that someone came up with. Um, and I so appreciate those people. He is a great dog, but the hair. And yeah. one of the first things I did was because um, I had him enrolled in doggy daycare, which is another rich people thing. But, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, when I would hear about it, I'd roll my eyes. And, um, and until I had Apollo and I was like, oh, wow. So yeah, yeah. this is a wonderful, magical place where I can take my dog. Um, but there was a groomer next door. And so I went to pick him up and noticed they were still open. So I walked him over there and I was so appreciative of she didn't wasn't with a client. She was, you know, closing down and she took 30 minutes and just went over his coat with me and what I needed to do. She wasn't trying, she was like, I can help you, but you can do this at home. And because he isn't a pure Husky, so he's a lot easier for me to take care of. But I was really astounded by what I did not know yeah. about you know his coat and what I needed to do. And I just figured, you know, I'll brush him here and there. And it's been three years and he gets brushed once a week outside. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's still a lot, but yeah, I have a whole new respect for um, that profession now. Well, it takes a lot for some groomers to actually sit down and talk to people too, but any clients of mine that have any type of questions, whether it's, you know, nails or even just how to properly brush the dog, I am more than willing to show them because it, I mean, it helps me, but it's also better for, for you to be doing it at home just so you can manage it and keep up with it too. Yeah. So we don't want to say that four letter word. What's that? nail Remember the <laughs> like come on you can you can do the nail and I was like no I can't I can't do the nail so I want to start from the beginning because I, I really really want people to get all of the information that I know that they're looking for as a groomer what would you recommend a person look for ask questions regarding when they are new to an area or they just get a dog for the first time and they need a groomer in the regiment of this particular um, dog. What, what are the right questions to ask? What am I supposed to be looking for? Besides the shop being clean and not smelling um, and things of that nature. Um, I mean, there's a lot of questions that you can ask. So experience is obviously one of them, but that's not to say that you know groomers that have been grooming for a year or two are not good groomers. Um, so you could ask for experience. You could ask if they went to school, if they apprenticed under someone, because you can do either of those options. And I think personally, the apprenticeship is probably better because you get long-term training. Most of the schools are maybe like two months and you learn kind of the basics and then they just kind of send you out into the world. Um, you could ask for references to see, you know, other places that they've worked, if they have a good reputation. And then you can always ask for pictures to see if their, their work is actually good. I think the reference point would be a good one. Um, most of the clients that we got over the years was word of mouth. So I think just asking around, asking in the community, you know, on Nextdoor, Facebook, you can get a lot of feedback that way. What is some tips that people can do to prepare their dogs if they've never been to a groomer so that all hell doesn't break loose on your table and the dog have a bad experience? See, that's kind of tricky because it depends if, you know, people get dogs from puppies, but I think desensitization to everything is very important. And that's from just even touching. So touching feet, touching tail, touching ears. There's a lot of people that get puppies and they don't do any of that. So when they come to the groomer and we're touching everything, you know, it's, it's very stressful for them because they don't know what's going on. <laughs> I keep telling um, you, let them bark. This is a show about dogs. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so now when we talk about touching, um, let's go ahead and talk and, and <laughs> talk about evasion of privacy. Why is it that I want to talk about expressing glands? Okay. Why is it that a lot of vets try to warn people 
about having their groomer express the glands as if to give this indication that maybe the groomers are not trained. So when you're going to school, are you trained or taught how to express the glands? Because a lot of groomers do it. And then if I don't ask you to do it, what makes you think it needs to be done? So the reason that they're probably saying that is groomers and vets do it different ways. So we do it externally and the vets do it internally. But where we are now, we don't express glands unless, unless you ask us to. And there's a reason for that is if the dog's not having problems with it and you start doing it, they'll actually lose function of that muscle. And then it's just a continual process where you just, you have to start doing it. Um, I mean, we're trained how to do it externally, but it's kind of one of those things if we get in there and we feel it and it feels like something that we're not, we're not comfortable even trying it. Like if they're very impacted back there, we will just send them to the vet to have it done internally instead. So hold up. There's an external version. Yes. Yeah. Did you know that, Kim? Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Oh, I thought you were going in. Oh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's invasive. Yeah. Well, I know. But I mean, I, I just, hey, this is when we ask the questions, right? <laughs> yeah. Just no. asking the question. She started talking about touching, she started talking I, um... about touching the dog. And, um, you know, I don't know why you always rob of us that background music. It's fine. It is absolutely fine. It is a husky. He is loud and he's hollering and howling and, and it's, it's, it's doing loud. Husky thing. He, he was sharing his opinion about <laughs> glands. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what he, he was had, doing. He had his anal glands done the other day. Oh, he needed it or you just wanted it done? No, um, he went to the vet and it turned into one of those where I took my dog to the vet to say, hey, is this okay? And they said, yes. And the appointment was going to cost so much just for that interaction that they decided, well, why don't we just do something? So they expressed his anal glands. <laughs> Poor dog. Poor dog. <laughs> um, okay, so what is too much of a bat? For a dog you mean like or how frequently it, can you yes, bathe them does it depend on the breed it depends on the breed and it kind of depends on the coat i would say weekly is probably it's almost too much because even if you're using like a mild shampoo like a oatmeal or like a hypoallergenic shampoo you're still stripping the oils out of their coat which isn't really good for their skin um i would have to base that kind of though like on how regularly to do it is just how dirty does the dog get? I mean, we have dogs that come in every four weeks and I mean, they are disgusting, like not even the same color that they're supposed to be. So I guess it, it's kind of environmental. It depends on where you live. Like this particular client, she lives next to a, um, a construction site. So it's just, you know, the dog goes outside and just is covered in dirt as soon as it goes outside. Yeah. Well, because I, that I, I bathe my dogs like- not healthy too, I would think. Yeah to be that dirty yeah I bathe my dogs a handful of times a year because um we they're, they're just not dirty I only bathe them when they roll in something yeah or they start smelling but for the most part I do um it's called a waterless bath even though it's liquid but someone explained the reason why they call it waterless is because I don't have to rinse it out yeah um, but I just I just spray that on them and brush their coat and then put um coconut oil on them. I mean honestly that's that's a great way to, to go about it. I think a lot of people actually over over groom well over bathe their dogs. Like it doesn't need to be done as much as people probably think unless the dogs are just filthy. Mm -hmm. Now let's go ahead and cut to the chase. You know that Harley is aka little funk. I mean when he comes in, I don't know what it is. You know, somebody once told me it was because he was more poodly. Now, I mean, if your father's a poodle and your mother's a golden retriever, I don't know how you could be more poodly, but um, his, his coat is certainly different and unique. I would say unusual for most golden doodles. And I, I agree. Har Harley is like an old man who hadn't bathed after about two weeks. I mean, he's just funky. I don't know how else to put, you walk past him and you're like, oh, um, <laughs> so he he's frowsy, foul. 
And, um, you know, he can clear a room. Because I know sometimes I bring him in and after I leave, I know Andy washes him first. She's <laughs> like, okay, come here, little son. Let me, let me. <laughs> yeah. um, but then Jax is a little bit different and Jax's coat is different. He just goes along for the ride. Mm-hmm. So, so I don't know. So talk How often to- do you take them? Me? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm, I'm right under the radar of the excessiveness. They go every two weeks. Okay. They go every Thursday. Um, or every other Thursday. Like, huh? Every, every other, other Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. yeah. At one o'clock, I'm hanging out with Andy. Uh, several reasons. It's very hot here. Um, and dogs do perspire. I don't care what people say, because I know that's part of Little Funk's problem. Um, I like to make sure that the ears are cleaned out and the hair's been plucked. And no, I can't do that either. It's, I just can't. Um, because if he, if Jax has a lot of hair in his ears, it traps the moisture and he's so prone to mm. ear infections. Yeah. Um, then there's the hospital thing. You know, they are yeah. in patients beds. Yeah. So I cannot have little funk, you know, up in a kid's bed. It's just not going to be a, a good thing. So for me and the hair under, in between their paws, Andy, you can say I'm wrong, but I would love on the podcast that you agree with me, but the hair is like a tressy doll. It just seems like it grows so fast in between the paw pads um, to when sometimes they're walking, they're sliding like little swiffets. So there's a multitude of things and Andy has full control. There are days when I take them and I think that they're just getting a bath and I'll pick them up and they look adorable because she's given them like a mini groom. So when, when Harley can't see because the hair is down like this, you know, she'll frame up his face for me. Or if Jax's ears are all uneven, she'll go across. See, Andy, I do pay attention to what you do. Um, <laughs> and it's just, it's just so much easier. And I know that she's conditioning them and taking real good care of, um, of them for me. So we're just on a regimen. And that's what we do. Yeah. And I think you have a lot of doodles in your um establishment so you probably every time i'm in there i see some one or two i think that's that's probably at least 80 percent of our client base right now is doodles and in that seems industry. to be a such a popular breed in the south and it you know they're kind of getting out of hand with it now because they're starting to combine things that i just don't understand like we have a springer doodle that comes in we have a boykin doodle we have a doby doodle it's just what, what was that one that we, because we did an episode where she looked up all the doodles and there was like, was it a Mal doodle? Because we, oh, yes. Ma- we love the Mal Noir. I'm that's, I mean. Me too. I just don't want to see him with a doodle, it, man. No, it's just sort of like, it's one of those where, did you do any homework <laughs> when you came up with so this? What idea? does the Dober, the, the Dober doodle look like? <sighs> I'm going to look it up. I don't even know how to explain her. She doesn't have a coat like a regular doodle. I mean, physically, like if you shaved her down, her body oh. shape would look like a Doberman. And then she just has kind of like wiry hair. It's very thin. You see it? Does she have the, oh my. Does she I'm, have the I'm height? I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> yeah, does she, does she have the height of a Doberman? She has, um, I wouldn't say she's not as energetic as a normal Doberman, but she does have a lot of Doberman like mannerisms, like some of the things that she does. Since I've had Dobermans, I can just recognize it immediately that there's Doberman in there. And I'm not, I'm not hating on this breed. I'm just trying to understand. There's another one. What's that? It's a Dober doodle too. I'm trying to, so when I got Harley, I did it because I'd never had a dog before. I knew that poodles were smart, but I also knew that golden retrievers were very gentle and I needed a dog like, you know, for the, the true first time dog owner, one that I didn't or wouldn't grow afraid of one that I just assumed in my sanctified mind that I could touch while he was eating, or I could, you know, the dog was not going to grow up or, and, and attack me. So that was the, like one of the basic reasons I started researching and looking at the golden doodle. Now I know people with the labradoodle, it's because of the playfulness of the lab and they had 
you know, little boys in the house and they thought, okay, this would be great and not as much hair. So my question is, I'm, I'm curious what would have attracted somebody to a Doberman poodle mix? It's cute uh, as a puppy. Yeah, but they're all cute as puppies, mm -hmm. you know? No, you said something about the, the Malinois doodle. There was someone here in Charleston, actually. I, it popped up on one of my feeds that was selling them. Malinois uh, poodle mixes, and they were calling them Mally noodles. And I was just like, I don't think <laughs> you understand. Like most people that get this dog are not going to understand what half of this dog is, mm -hmm. and it's just going to be a disaster. Like why? Why did you even think this was a good idea? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, because Apollo is a they call him a Goberian, and um, I mean he's a great dog. Apollo is a great dog, but when I the first year that I had him, the common question that I got from people, is he more golden or is he more husky? And um, for like the first year, so his first year with us, he was sometimes golden, sometimes husky. But as he's gotten older, the golden comes like when he misses me and he's cuddly and stuff. But otherwise, he's all husky. I mean, it's, it's I, I feel like the golden sort of tampered down a little bit of the husky but yeah. he's a husky but and yeah. he made me appreciate husky owners and because it's it's a different type of dog and yeah. um he has his own mind and and it, it took some time for us to jail together so but um so it's just like yeah I used to think it wasn't a big deal when people it's like yo who cares but now I I understand why people care yes yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you do so um Senior dogs, first of all, help us professionally understand the dryer seizure concept. Or okay. Um, no one really knows why it starts happening when dogs get older. My best guess would be, you know, as dogs age, their hearing changes. And I think that that has something to do with it because sometimes it, it does happen out of nowhere. There are times that you're just drying a dog and there's no reaction to anything and then it just happens. But typically you what can- What is it that happens? What's I would, I don't, it's not like a seizure. It's more like a panic attack. Like the dog will start just barking kind of uncontrollably, you know, just freaking out and you have to take time to just calm the dog down. So there are times that you can see it, like, you know, it's getting ready to happen or you can see where it's escalating to that point. And professionally, you should be able to tell and judge when that's going to happen and just realize that that's just too much for the dog. But there are some people that are just kind of oblivious to it or just not paying attention when it happens. But anytime you're grooming a senior dog, it is a, it's a completely different ball game because even apart from that, you're dealing with, you know, sore joints, sore muscles, things don't work the way that they used to. So you have to kind of revert back to almost how you learn how to groom a puppy. You know, you have to figure out what's more comfortable for the dog, even if it's less comfortable for you. So to help even make this, more um, understandable when we're talking about a, grooming a senior dog. You're the perfect person to give a brief synopsis of what Harley was like when you first started grooming him and he was in the, the prime of his life. And then um, when I don't you understand. got him- I don't understand got, that voice. Huh? I don't understand that voice. <laughs> <laughs> And then what he was like when I brought him to you, you know, after he was thrown out <laughs> what, and, and, and what he's like now, because you know, a lot was, of this has to do with you and how you he, handled him. He was, you know, before he left, just normal, you know, stand for everything, would tolerate anything you did for him. And then when he reached out to me and you were telling me about that, I was like, I don't remember him ever having any kind of problem with grooming. I mean, you get him groomed regularly. There's no reason for this to be an issue. So the first time you came back in, when you were there, I, you know, I did everything very slow because I wanted to judge where he was. And, you know, his first time back, you could tell he was like, I remember you, but, you know, I don't know. But even when he was there this past week, I mean, I don't know if you noticed how much more I could get around his mouth, but he's allowing me to do more and more because the first time that he came back in, he didn't even want me touching his face. Like if I went to touch his face, he'd move away. Or if I was trying to hold his chin, he'd move away. Mm -hmm. And it's been gradual that we're getting back to the point where he still trusts me. He knows that I'm not going to do anything weird. But yeah, I mean, the first two times, he really didn't want me doing anything around his face. 
I really turned into the, the perfect gentleman again. Yeah, I love that you you um, respect his boundaries that he's setting. Yes, because I mean, I that's think- something that's something that you have to do. You have to know, you know, for puppies, it's important to kind of train them and make sure that you're stern with certain things just so that they understand that this behavior is not allowed. Mm-hmm. But with senior dogs or dogs that are difficult, you have to know where their threshold is almost. So if they're giving you all of these signs, you have to figure out a way to work around what they're not accepting of. There's a lot of groomers that, you know, will get really frustrated, but it's just, it's part of the job. I think, you know, I, since I don't take my dog to the groomer and it wasn't, you know, my, except for my border collie and Apollo, you know, all of our other dogs have um, had short coats. So we had Zoe here now, but her brother Scout and then Rodrigo's sister, Sydney, they all had short coats. So brushing them was just a matter of just brushing and we're done. It was like, not even five minutes of work, Mm -hmm. but, um, now it's like with our dogs, what I found interesting is I'm standing in the aisle at the pet store, looking at all these different brushes. And what's frustrating is that they don't really tell you what all of these things do. They have the names, but they don't really tell you. And I finally, thankfully I was at, um, I think it was pet smart and they, my brother works for PetSmart, yay. And um, they gave me free training for Scout and Zoe when they were puppies. And it was in exchange for some blog posts. And our trainer who was amazing, decided she didn't wanna be a trainer anymore. She wanted to go into grooming. So she went to school and started grooming. And I saw her there in the grooming section and I'm confused, but I went and knocked on the window since she wasn't working and she came out and helped me choose what I needed. Because I mean, how do we, who we don't have any experience with this, figure out what we need for our dogs? I mean, it's definitely hard to figure out that and there's so many, there's so many different options, whether it's companies or different types of brushes. And I mean, the majority of, I mean, there are some brushes out there that I don't think have any purpose, but the majority of them have a purpose <laughs> and are, you know, directed for certain types of coats, like undercoat rakes, you know, there's different kinds of uh, like slicker brushes. It really depends on the type of coat that your dog has. And I think the best way to figure that out would be to ask a groomer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you can find one that's willing to sit down and talk to you about it, but I mean, there's, there's so many people that come into our store that, you know, the dog is matted and they're like, well, I'm brushing every day. It's like, well, what are you using to brush? And they show me and I'm like, you need to be using a comb too, but it's just information that they haven't, no one's told them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Kimberly, I sent you two pictures because I don't have my phone, so I can't hold them up to the um, camera, but um, one is, you know, it took a few weeks before I could get Andy and Harley together. So you can see where she just chose to cut all of the hair off because she said she didn't want to traumatize him by trying to blow dry a whole lot. And then she goes there, there, that's that picture. And that was the first time. And then the second picture is the second time I brought him in and I just love this because <laughs> that's when I realized that Harley remembered who she was. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I can go now. It just melts my heart. I'm like, <laughs> I can go now because he's okay. I mean, Andy, you said earlier something about, you know, you know, these, your relationship with these animals. And last year we interviewed a pet sitter and she said the same thing. And, and it's like, you have a relationship with the animals. And I think we as pet parents forget that the other humans that come in and out of our dog's lives, like our dogs know them too. So like we have a dog walker um, that I actually could have stopped using him a long time ago, but I continue using him because he's Apollo's friend and Apollo loves him and gets so excited when he sees him. And and it's hilarious because even if it's not on, like he's coming by to walk him, um, if we go to uh, the park or something or go somewhere where I know his dog walker is going to be. And it is so much fun when he just gets a whiff of, and he starts looking around, like he hears his voice or he, get, and he knows that that's his friend. And he just goes absolutely insane. That noise you heard earlier, he gets absolutely insane because his friend is here. And, and it's so hilarious to um, just to see that relationship. So it's like, I think that that's also, um, for me, 
was a lesson in you can't just change up people yeah. all over and over again because you're starting from scratch every single time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's something that most people probably don't think about. I mean, when my husband was in the army and we were moving around, I still get texts from, you know, old clients or my old boss, you know, saying that so and so had passed away and it's still upsetting. You know, I haven't seen any of these people in like 10 years, but it's still, you know, I feel it, you know. We we had such a relationship for so long. So we definitely have relationships with the dogs and the clients. So it has to go both. It has to be both of it. And plus you're another set of eyes because you know, you may see something since your hands are on the animal that we didn't pick up on, which, cause it's like, that's so important. That's how I've been able to, I was able to find scouts um, lymphoma was because I massaged him, but you know, how many people actually do take the time? I mean, I can't, tell, I can't tell you the number of times that I've found things like that. I have actually found a, a lump on a dog's lymph node before. Mm -hmm. and the owners that know about it. But I mean, using the blow dryer, when you're using it, you can see directly down to the skin. So there's a lot of things that we can see that the owner just might not see. It's not saying that they're not doing their job, but when the hair is separated, you can really see everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a, at least a monthly thing where we find something new. And I always, always, you know, go out there and I show them exactly where it is. And sometimes it's nothing, maybe just like a hot spot, but I still want to make them aware of it so that they can either make their own decision to take them to the vet or just deal with it at home. Mm -hmm. So in the questionnaire, I asked you if you had any particular products that you liked and you were like, oh boy, yes. <laughs> so you said you had some products to show us and talk about us. Oh because yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, um, if you're listening, Kimberly will put the links for these products. Yes, I will. Um, and if you're on YouTube, well, then you can, can actually see what they look like. But this is so fascinating, Kimberly, to me because I'm always interested in like leave-in conditioners, the right comb, you know. I didn't bring any of the shampoos or conditioners just because they're gallon bottles and you know, there are people at work today. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it is always kind of cool to see things from a groomer's point of view. Cause when I've in the past gone to super zoo and there's that whole grooming section, I will go over there and just start talking to them about the products because you know, there's the, the product section and you, I mean, I can be talked into anything. If you have a good, if you have a good sales game and some nice packaging and it smells good, I can yeah. be talked into anything, but I'll go over to the groomer section and they're just sort of like, yeah, no. And let me tell you why. I So for like shampoos and conditioners, I use a company, it's called iGroom. And, you know, a lot of people have asked, so what is your favorite out of their, their lineup? And that's really hard to answer because they have shampoos for different types of coats. So they have like a de-shedding shampoo and then they have a drop coat shampoo for dogs like Shih Tzus and Yorkies. So they have a huge variety, but all of their products are really, really great. And they're actually, they're made by a groomer, the person who actually created the brand. So to me, that makes more sense because they actually know what they're doing. A lot of the companies that make shampoos, hmm. they're like, well, let's make it do this, and make it smell good. But they're not really thinking about what it's doing for the coat, as long as it gets the dog clean. Yeah. But that's my go-to for shampoos, conditioners. They have some good sprays. Um, everything else is, it's kind of all over the place. Cause there are a lot of companies that have really good products, but uh, clippers, the cords all wound up. <laughs> this is what I use for, for clippers. And this brand is actually called Andy's. So it's kind of easy to remember. <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I owned the company, but sadly I don't. <laughs> But they have a lot of good brushes and combs and stuff like that. And they're a little bit probably, you know, if you were doing stuff at home, I think that that would be a good way to go because they're a little bit more affordable. Most of the, the combs and brushes that I use um, are from a company, it's Chris Christensen. And he is okay. also, he's, a, he's also a groomer. Um, so his stuff, his stuff is a little is bit- expensive though. Yeah, his stuff is pricey. Um, but it's the quality of some of the stuff too. But like I said, if you're doing if you're doing it at home, you don't need like this is one of the brushes that I have. It's Look Chris at Christensen. That. Um, I don't remember how much this was, but like this is, is that a, a Chris Christensen brush. It is, yeah. And then this is a comb from him, and this was sixty dollars. So like you don't need to spend <laughs> this much if you're doing it at home. And there's also like ten different kinds of combs. I don't think people realize that there's one sort of you know there's finishing combs, there's prepping combs, so there's all kinds of different things like that. And this is one of Chris, one of the uh, his brushes too, which is a little bit smaller. But that's the stuff that I use for for brushing out coats and things like that. But like this is a 
This is a dematting rake. Oh, nice. And I think this is from um, Four Paws, which is also, it's another affordable company. Um, is that the one that you come through and it has the razors to kind of get the mats? Yeah, so on the inside of it is where it's really sharp. So you have to be very careful when you're using it, but you can kind of mm -hmm. get under it and do this and it'll kind of break, break the mats up for you. Don't recommend it if you don't know what you're doing because it's very easy for you to slice your dog somewhere. Yes. Like unless someone, unless a groomer or you, you know, someone shows you exactly how to use it, don't do this at home. <laughs> well, good to know because I would have gotten up after this and gone to the pet store and said. <laughs> we have I, a lot of people that, that that do that actually I, well, I can tell you Kimberly if you have somebody to teach you because before I left Virginia so for my boys right in here because this is a lot of times where they scratch if they're gonna have a mat or something it's in here so for me to brush it consistently I'm pulling on what's this Andy I'm gonna impress you probably the <laughs> thinnest most sensitive skin in a dog correctly mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. I could literally damage or tear the skin. So I have one of those gizmos, but mine has a guard on it. And my groomer in Virginia purchased it and then made me use it and taught me in front of him before he let me bring it home. And so if I can't get the mat out before it gets too bad, I use it, but it's like little short motions and movements and you're really moving the mat all the way down to the end and then it comes off. So if you need it, you just need somebody to show you how to use it. I do yeah, have a really cool brush that, that it doesn't, it's not like what you're talking about, but um, that I use on Rodrigo. And it's one of those where um, the people, the groomer that I was talking about earlier showed me how to do it of just, because I was like, my dog hates when I brush it. And it's like, because you're trying to do this, you need to do this and just yes. gently go through. And it doesn't mm -hmm. make a lot of difference. Nice. Yeah. I, as far as things that are sharp, um, if you don't know what you're doing, please, please don't try it at home. <laughs> We've had, I've had so many dogs come in that have had, it seems like the main area that people will nick is the ears, mm. but we had one lady, um, I'll never forget this because she had this doodle that, you know, was probably like six inches of coat and she was trying to cut a mat out of the dog's neck. And she told me about it when she dropped the dog off, but um, she was like, yeah, I think I, I think I might've nicked him a little, but I'm not sure. So before I even took him back there, you know, I'm digging through the hair to find it. And he had a huge cut on his neck. And oh, I was like, yeah. you need to take him to the vet right now. I was like, I'm not taking him back there. And she ended up, she had two dogs. So she came to pick up the other dog and I asked what happened. And the dog had to get 12 staples. Oh, and wow. she, she didn't even notice. Ooh. So like keep the sharp objects away from your dogs unless you know what you're doing, please. Yes. And I know this sounds weird, but this is what, this is the fear I have with the nail. Like I know, you know, Harley's going to be running around missing something because I'm going to do something it's, wrong. <clears throat> it's a legit fear. I have cut Zoe's quick so many times. It's not even funny. I have the quick powder, which, you know, and I have it right there just in case I've gotten so good at it. And what I've learned to do is just take, I shave it off. A little bit, yep. Yep, a little bit at a time because she's she's my only dog that has black nails. And I just shave off a little bit of a time and her her nails are longer than the other dogs because um, I'm just going very carefully. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if I'm just like, yeah, I'm not gonna do this. I will, I have a local pet store because I don't vaccinate um, my adult dogs anymore. She's a senior now. And um, I know of one pet store that they're like, it's okay, Kimberly. And so they'll <laughs> take her back and they'll trim back her nails just to like to get me to a starting point. And I'll do that with her like once a year and then I'll trim them for the rest of the time. But yeah, it, I actually had someone come to our home to teach me how to clip their nails because I was so afraid. I mean, it, it's a legitimate fear. And, you know, the, with the blood vessel that's running through the nail, if you do nick it, everyone panics because it seems like it's so much blood. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like a massacre. It's crazy how yes. much they can bleed. So it, it is a legitimate fear. And then the people feel guilty. And I'm like, you know, it happens. It happens to everyone. You know, anyone that has tried to do their dog's nails has probably clicked their dog. And it's, it's not as big of a deal as everyone probably thinks it is. It's more traumatizing probably for us than it is for them. But I mean, it is a legitimate fear, but for me, it's, you know, I've been doing this for so long and so many dogs a day. It's just, I could probably do it blindfolded. I'm just, you know, do it all the time, but it's pretty rare that I actually use 
nail clippers anymore unless the dogs are really bad. Um, yeah. We use a, we actually have four different Dremels that we use. I this is the only one that I could bring just because- Can it, you turn it, it on? It's broken. Oh, damn it. Well, it's okay. So it's going to be loud, but I do like this one because it has a light on it. Oh, nice. But I yeah, want a Dremel. I bought dropped. one. I bought one off of, you know, one of those like Facebook ads. <laughs> And it was yes. like, and it had a bunch of great reviews that were probably fake and it didn't do a darn thing. I got, I still have it and it turns on and everything, but it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Any of the, so we have two that are specifically for pets and then we have some that are actually like industrial Dremels, you know, the $200 huge ones. Um, two of the pet ones that we have work really well for like smaller dogs, but the, you know, for the bigger dogs, I'm just trying to get it done as quick as I can. And I'll use that big Dremel, but mm -hmm. it kind of depends on the dog. Some dogs really don't want any, you know, anything vibrating on their nail like that. So you have yeah. to kind of gauge what they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. It just depends. Yeah. Zoe doesn't like it. So I, that's why I never bought another one. And my boys, I can, I can trim their nails easily, but Kathy, like with Apollo, he doesn't like his nails being trimmed. And so I do a lot of, of what you were talking about earlier, Andy, of just touching his paws just for no reason. And just you know holding his paws and and stuff and when i need to trim his nails i i have a, a bed i make the bed and i sprinkle if i need to do his left side i sprinkle treats all along the right side <laughs> and so he's eating treats while i'm and i'm like and i've gotten really fast and then when it's time to switch i sprinkle treats and i do the other side and if i'm not able to get them all then we'll just start again the next day but that's, you gotta do what you gotta do after the lady, you know, yelled at me because I don't do nails, I paid attention. So shout out to Wolfgang um, Bakery and Grooming in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, um, where I take the boys to see Andy. It's a really nice shop because they have tons of homemade um, treats that you can buy by the ounce. And then they have the frosted stuff that just makes my teeth ate because it looks like it's a mound of sugar with cute words you know uh, they have a birthday section which I'm going to take a picture for you because you love that and all kinds of stuff when I go I like I'm there for a long time because I'm talking and chatting and looking at new stuff and I see people come in all the time just to get the nails and like they'll just Cameron will take them in the back and somebody will just stop hurry up and do the nails and bring them right back out. So I, I'm not alone in that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it. I don't trust myself. And so it's kind of like, if I feel that way, then um, I'm going to stick to my, my feelings and yeah. just have somebody else do it. Yeah. So well, I'm well, I think, I think that the nails are another area that's kind of, people just kind of brush past it and don't really think about how important it is. But I mean, the longer that the nails get, you know, it can cause arthritis. It can cause all kinds of problems for their feet. And a lot of people don't think about it. You know, they'll bring their dog in for grooming like every three months and then they get mad at us because we can't get the nails any shorter. And I have to explain to them that the quick in their nails, it, it's not stationary. It doesn't stay there. It can either recede or grow. So the longer you go in between nail trims, the more it's growing. So if you want to get them shorter, you have to do it more frequently. Um, and if you're trying to work the quicks back, I would say you can, I mean, we have dogs that are in the process of doing that right now that are there every other week. So the more you do it, the shorter you can get the nails. It's just a, a thing of keeping up with it. You know, it, I've, I've tried to kind of, I don't want to say train, but show some of our clients how to do it at home because there's a lot of them that can't get there, you know, depending on their schedule or their work night shifts or there's all these other things. So I do try to show them, but it's definitely something that's extremely important that a lot of people just don't even really think about. Yeah, it is hard. Again, that's another thing. It's hard to find a nail clipper that works because what I, I have so many clippers because one day I just ordered a ton of them. And um, what I found is like, cause they'll have clippers that they say it's for large dogs but they actually don't work. The clippers that work the best on my dogs are actually clippers that were made for, I think, medium dogs, not for large dogs. And I think when they talk about the size of the dog, I, I think that they're talking about kind of like the thickness of the nail, really, not yeah. really the size of the dog. And so my dogs don't have super, super thick nails. So they don't need these really industrial clippers. Um, but yeah, it's not easy. 
um, I mean, figuring most, it out. Most nail clippers are not, are not great. It's really hard to find a, a, pair, a pair that's good. I've tried all kinds of different brands, different companies, you know, even ones that people have just sent in for us to try. Mm -hmm. And honestly, most of them are garbage. It's yeah. really hard to find a nail clipper that, that works and is quick and effective because like the longer that you're trying to do it, the more pressure you're putting on it. So you need something that's actually going to get the job done quickly yeah. rather than you sitting there squeezing the nail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have mine are Miller's Forge and they, they're this, like this one thing and they're always sold out because I think everyone has, else has figured out that those are the only clippers that seem to work. And so whenever Probably. they're in stock, I will buy a couple packets just to have them on um, standby. And, and also with clippers, I know you, you mostly use the Dremel, but do we need to be sharpening our clippers? Because I bet you most of us aren't. I'm not. I've never done it. I'm sure that you probably could. Yeah, you, usually with, like with nail clippers, once they start getting bad, I always just throw them away. I'm yeah. sure that you could probably could get them sharpened, but to me, it's just like- They're not very the expensive, so. Yeah. Can, if y'all have finished with the nails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, I don't want to interrupt or anything. Uh, <laughs> talk to me about dryers dog i know that there's a lot of dryers and i've been looking at blow dryers for dogs you know just to have one i i'm not every a few people that i know jumped to the flying pig um dryer i'm not really sold on that i did get a chance to see it um i never used it but it would seem to me that we need to be concerned about the noise and the temperature of the dryer and the pressure of the air, correct? Yes. So do you have anyone in particular that you think for the home use would be a good dryer? Oh, that's, that's tough. Okay. There are, there are several, almost any company that makes dryers has one that would be acceptable to use at home. <clears throat> any of the smaller ones really usually aren't that loud. Um, it's when you get the, the big ones, the ones that we have in the shop that are usually loud, but, um, if someone's going to do it at home, I would definitely get one that is adjustable. So some of them have like switches where it's like one or two switches for one or two of the motors that are inside the dryer, but mm -hmm. there's other ones that actually have a knob that you can adjust to, you know, whatever speed you want it to be. And that would probably be what I would recommend for someone that's like starting to use it at home because you can, you can start out slow and then see, kind of see what you're comfortable with, what the dog's comfortable with, but it's completely adjustable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the best of the best, um, according to best reviews is still the flying pig. Um, then they have one that's like best bang for your buck. And actually it's not that expensive, Kimberly, yeah. in retrospect to what you were thinking. Um, like you can buy the best of the best um, for less than $200 on Amazon. So why wouldn't you just use a regular people hair dryer? I think the it, heat, right? It just takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Like once you have, um, like the hoses that come with them, they'll typically come with a couple different nozzles that you can put on the end. Mm -hmm. So when you're using a hair dryer, you know, you have that, that wide thing that's, it's not getting the air where it's supposed to be. It's just a broad area. But if you get the nozzles, it can, the one that we usually use is almost like a funnel. So it funnels the air into like one centralized location mm -hmm. and it just makes it a lot easier to dry it. And it, <clears throat> definitely for a dog like a Husky, you, you would definitely want that, that nozzle on there because that's going to help blow out the undercoat. Like if you use the hair dryers, you know, it's just going to take forever to actually dry a dog. Yeah. So if we go to the beach or if we get really wet, we're not dirty, but what happens is now, Harley has stood in the doorway and I swear he's <laughs> rolled his eyes at me because um, it's getting close to his dinner time and he keeps us on, on schedule. But um, so Harley's hair will really just crinkle up like Bob Marley. I mean, he looks like he has dreads, cute as can be. So I, and with Jax, if we go to the beach, of course, I've got to hose him off and get all of that sand out of him. So mm -hmm. I need, I don't need, I would like to have a dryer at home that I could go ahead and use, you know, like on the front porch and give him somewhat of a, I've been kind of groomed look, you know, when we, when we leave. 
but I, I guess maybe the I, I got to give the flying pig an, another try because that's that seems to be the go-to dryer that everybody talks about. And I've never even heard of it. You, huh? <laughs> I've never even heard of it. I don't know where the name comes from, but it's literally called the flying pig high velocity dog pet grooming dryer. I'll have to look it up and I'll get back to you when you come back to the shop. Okay. So now I'm curious. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you, you check it out and let me know. Um, but yeah, the, it's got, yeah, I'm not going to read the stats. It's just on there. Uh, before we let you go though, one question that I asked, and I was very, very interested in your response, um, what it was that you really wanted to discuss. And you said spreading awareness about the importance of grooming on a professional level and also um, at a home level, and also about having a good groomer client relationship and having realistic goals and expectations for your pets. So do you want to expand on that? Well, I think that we covered a decent amount of that, but I think for the realistic goals and expectations, you know, if you have a dog that's bad for a certain thing, you, you need to be able to work with your groomer. You need to be able to talk to them about it and they need to be able to talk to you, you know, if something's going on. There's a lot of groomers that if a dog is doing something, you know, and the, the client comes to pick up, they're like, oh yeah, he was great today, but he wasn't. So you need to be able to have that kind of communication and also with expectations for, for haircuts. We have a lot of people that just don't brush their dog enough. And then, you know, they get upset with us when we have to shave the dog down. But realistically, you know, you're not doing the work at home. And I don't know what you expect us to do if you're in here every eight weeks. We see your dog for, you know, two hours every eight weeks. We can't undo the past eight weeks. So if you want your dog to be long, you need to start watching. I mean, there's tons of videos on YouTube. You know, if you wanted to get really in depth with it, <clears throat> you could look up a certified master groomer and then just type in whatever type of dog you have. And they will probably be able to go over absolutely everything in depth with you. I'm sure that there are some YouTube videos where, you know, it's just someone sitting at home and they're probably not doing it correctly, but like whatever type of haircut you want for your dog, you need to make sure that you're putting in the work at home to be able to achieve it. You know, we want to, we want the dog to be comfortable and there's a lot of people. So this is another thing with senior dogs, actually, that's a pretty, pretty good point. We have a lot of people that are not willing to give up the vanity. So they want their dog to look a certain way when realistically, you know, once a dog hits a certain age, grooming is just too much for a lot of dogs. And I'm not talking about like how he is, but I mean, just standing up or doing this or that. And we try to, you know, tell people the best thing for your dog right now would be to take him short, push the grooming out, you know, short everywhere, head, just take all the hair off the dog. So we don't have to do this very often, but you know, humanity just goes out the window at that point because they don't want their dog to look stupid. So that's another thing that I think people eventually are going to, you know, need to let go of. And that's not even just for senior dogs. It's for dogs that are difficult. You know, we need to do what's best for your dog while trying to keep the client happy too. But eventually the dog's, you know, the priority. If the dog can't do this, can't do that, we're not going to fight with the dog to try to make, you know, make the dog look pretty. The dog doesn't care what it looks like. The dog doesn't look in the mirror and go, you know, I don't really like this haircut. Maybe we'll try something different next time. So trying to get people to accept that sometimes the best option may not be your favorite one, but we, we need to start looking out for the dogs a little bit. Yeah. And that was a conversation that we had um, Thursday about just keeping Harley short. It, it makes it a little bit easier for him. Um, I may be able to just take a towel, a damp towel and, um, you know, wipe a little funk off from time to time and just keep it moving because yep. I mean he's cute either way to me so that's really all that that I think that matters got anything else Kimberly no I'm excited you are <laughs> I'm gonna go brush my down. dogs after this <laughs> I saw you jotting down notes yep I've, I've added a new clippers to my um um, my shopping cart, but then I, when I went over there, for some reason, I thought that they were a lot more than they are, and they are very, very cheap. So I think I'm actually going to run over to the pet store and talk to the groomers and get something and a little better. The, the groomer. well, I do have one. More, I have one question for Andy, though. Okay. Andy, do you know Billy? That <laughs> Louie. Billy. <laughs> no. Oh so, yeah, my friend Billy Hookman. 
Um, I talk about him. I don't feel like I talk about him a lot, but I talk Nobody about knows him. Billy, Andy, but Kimberly. So I'm, I'm just going to continue <laughs> to take a poll until somebody says yes. It hasn't the, happened. People in the raw feeding world <laughs> know months. who Billy is. It's been 15 months. I'm going to bring Billy on. I'm going to actually see Billy down in California next week. So I'm going to bring Billy on. Uh -huh. and yeah, because we want to know who, we're going to get shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, who the heck is Billy? <laughs> you can have that on yours and I'll just have a picture of his face on mine. Okay. All right. <laughs> Andy, I hope you had some fun hanging out with us. We certainly did. enjoyed talking this was to fun. you. This was fun. Um, no, I learned a lot. Really <laughs> great. Yes, she did. Because she's real quiet. Normally, Kimberly is not I know. Quiet. I'm listening. I know. I'm <laughs> listening. So, um, yeah. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Talk to y'all later. Okay. Bye. 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 So, that was fun. <clears throat> great. That was fun. Wow, I have so I was I wrote stuff down. So certified master groomer. I'm I gonna, know. I I'm to, gonna I Google have... that for for golden. For Apollo. I'm gonna yeah. Google, Google it for husky. But yeah, I mean Apollo is so and it's so funny because I don't often say this, but he is so easy to group and he loves being brushed. I pull out a brush and he just comes and sits down. He loves being brushed. But he I I got the lucky end of the stick when it comes to that breed mix. And I don't say this to encourage anybody to try and breed this mix or anything like that, but with Apollo, because as we know, like not all of the golden doodles are exactly the same. You have two that look very different. They're both white, but they're, you could tell their coats are very different. So, but with Apollo, he is, seems to have more of a golden coat on most of his body, but towards his hind, it's very thick and husky, but he doesn't have the blowouts. So people were warning me about, you know, look out for the blowouts where you start seeing chunks of hair trying to come out. He doesn't have that. So I just, well, so that's, that's why, I, yeah. So I just brush him on a weekly basis and, you know, cause, and I did it in the summer to keep him cool. And mm -hmm. um, I don't do it as much in the winter because it's just not necessary. I mostly do a, um, a light brushing to, keep the shedding down but um he's really the the dog that's the hardest for me to groom um and that's most work is rodrigo the border collie mix he has a ton of hair and it's long and it's just like and it's just like it takes it takes time to go through and it can tangle and stuff so i have to go really slowly with it and i have to do it on a regular basis because like what she said if you're going to go two months without brushing your dog, then you're going to have a hot mess. And he, um, he'll start hating the brush and not wanting to do it. So I just take him outside, let him sit in the shit, lay in the shade. And while he's laying there, I give him treats and I brush him, but it doesn't take long because I have a nice routine with him. Yeah. The biggest thing for me is seasonal and it's Jack's tail. Jack has a very traditional retriever tail. Mm-hmm. So um, that's the only area that I ever use the Furminator on mm -hmm. and not on Harley, but on him. And Leo's tail was like that. Jax and Leo are very similar in terms of coat, hair and texture. But um, the difference is that Leo loved being um, groomed. Jax is just a hot mess. Like, <laughs> I got to catch him on the fly. Like I'll just <laughs> hold the brush and when he sees it and runs by, I, I get like, <laughs> like raking. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, and Harley is pretty good as long as he wants to be bothered. Yeah. If you catch him and he's reclined in a position where he just doesn't care, mm -hmm. then you can have your way with him. Yeah. But if he's on the move and he has other plans, go away. I'm coming. Um, Did I tell you about my anti itch spray that I made? You made an anti itch spray. I made an anti itch spray. Um, I actually, Rodney Habib who is the co-author of the forever dog he posted about us this years ago on facebook and i recently saw another um, veterinarian have a video about it on youtube and i don't think his video is you 
was new, but I think I was looking up something and I came across a video. And so I watched it. But anyway, um, I did um, two cups of brewed green tea and I mixed in like three or four tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and about 10 or 15 drops of lavender oil. Now the lavender oil was the vet's recipe that wasn't in Rodney's recipe, but I mixed that up and put it into a spray bottle and I put a little label on it and um, I shake it and I spray it on, cause um, I told you Apollo has his itchy butt area and I spray it on that and it takes away the itch right away. It's huh. really nice. Yeah. And so I think I already told you when we went to the vet, the vet, and I told the vet, and that was my hundred dollar tab was you're doing I'm good. Using, I'm still using the wound care. Yeah. And that seems to be fine. Um, if, you know, Harley's underbelly thing is, you know, when I see him licking, um, then I go ahead and, and use that. So I may just finish out that and then get that recipe from you. Um, yeah. Because I told you we reduced his uh, Apoquil. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. He is now just a half a tablet in the evening. So and with the Apoquil, will he go off of it completely like in the wintertime? Yeah, I will, I will probably mid-October. I won't have to give it to him again until spring. Okay. But... Um, Dr. Craig's husband, Dr. Johnson, he said that um, at this the, point, the voice, Dr. Johnson, it's randomly. <laughs> That's how he talks. He's a big guy and he has a deep voice. You know? Like he'll go, come with me. And I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> nice guy, nice guy. Um, but yeah, we talked at, at great length and he said, I think at this point, Harley could probably just go. And I said, well, is there something wrong with the whole tablet? He said, no, but I, I just don't think that you need to do that, you know, as frequent as you did before. So I'm really happy. We seem to, we're on cool foods, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I, cool I, and I proteins. Just, yes, I think we are, we're, we're turning that corner, if you will. Nice. But, Very good. Yeah. So you're going to vacuum? I'm going to vacuum. I'm going to brush some dogs. I have, um, I took a couple days off from my day job because I need to write some articles um, and I need to bank these podcast episodes since I'll be out of town next weekend. And yeah, just go enjoy the day. It's, we're, we're down to our last sunny days. And so I'm going to try to take advantage of them. Yeah, I don't know what my temperature is. It's not really... It's not hot. It's not cool. It's just loverly. Mm -hmm. That's how it is I, here. I, it's just a loverly kind of day. And I looked and it's going to be like this in Southern California too, because I was worried that I'm going to head down to California. It's going to be nineties and, and nope, it's going to be in the upper seventies. And you got to go see your brother, right? No, he is in Arizona. I am going to California. It would be cool if he came over though, but no, I'm going to a conference. Um, it's a uh, it's called um, Redefining Pet Health, and it's a one-day conference in Newport Beach, California. So I'm flying down. Some friends of mine, the folks, I'll give them a shout out, the folks over at um, Real Dog Box. So thank you, um, Ruby and Turk, uh, are flying me down, and I'm going to tour their facilities and hopefully, you know, snag me some treats. And, uh -huh. <laughs> and then we're going to go to Newport to attend the conference together. Um, but, and then I'm Excellent. there, I'm going Excellent. to enjoy some yummy, yummy Mexican food because it's like, oh, I'm excited. I'm mostly excited to eat. Okay. <laughs> I think that you need to, um, curb that excitement or share it with the fact that you are really, really excited to be with them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's practice that now. Ready? Okay. Well, I'm excited that, that they'll be eating that with me. Take two. Go ahead, <laughs> I'm excited that they'll be eating with me, but it's like they'll know the cool places to go. I was talking to my boss about it the other day, and he was telling me, "Oh, this is where you need to go." So I'm excited. Ah, oh, I'm oh. just so happy you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly, it'll be fun. And Billy, Billy Hookman will be speaking at this event. Now, mm -mm, let me tell you, I, the only thing that you can do for me right now, you and Billy, 
Now, if Billy, if you call me and and Billy's on the phone, I need it to be a FaceTime call. <laughs> here, I'm gonna find Billy. Oh, here he is. Here's Billy. Come on. Oh, I can't. I'm trying to find a picture of him. He he just posts pictures of his baby and his dog. It's like I never see pictures of him. Ah, here we go. He probably won't like it, but here's a video of him, I guess, dribbling a basketball. That's Billy. Yeah, very classy, Billy. That oh, could, he made it. That could be anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Would you stop recording so we can talk business? Okay, goodbye. Goodbye, Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.